Welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Dee Nash from Guthrie, Oklahoma, where I garden on 7.5 acres out in the country. And I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana, where I garden on a suburban lot measured in square feet. It's less than a third of an acre. We call ourselves Garden Angelus because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening and we want you to love it too. Yes, we do. And we aren't afraid to spill the beans and tell all of our gardening secrets, the good, the bad, and even the ugly. But that's enough of who, what, when, and where. Let's move on to this week's episode. Hello, Dee. Hello, Carol. How's Indiana? You know what? Like as usual, it's Monday, and it is a beautiful, sunny, bright, crisp fall day. About 40 degrees. It's lovely outside. Guess what? What? In Oklahoma, it is almost the same. It is 42 degrees. It is crisp and beautiful outside, and there's a wind blowing, so I'll be wearing a hat later today when I go out and walk. Hey, D. Yeah? Isn't there always a wind blowing in Oklahoma? No, not always. Oh. But it does blow here a lot. So what did you do this week in the garden? This week, um, well, I should say that uh, earlier in the week, or like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, were really good days to work outside. So I mowed the lawn for the last time of the season, I think. You always drop your blade a half inch and mow it short so it goes into the, the winter shorter. The local greenhouse opened up just for a few weeks to sell Christmas greens for pots and things. Ran down there. She had two bags of daffodil bulbs still sitting there on the shelf. Gave me a good price. I got 40 daffodil bulbs and planted them. Uh, I set up all my outdoor lights, half of which didn't work when I turned them on. But that is not for a gardening podcast because that's, I got to fiddle with that. But I don't turn them on until the day after Thanksgiving. So there's time to mess with it. Oh, and speaking of Thanksgiving, I wrote a blog post about a Thanksgiving bunny named Thumper. I will link to it. You have a lot of bunnies in your garden. They're seasonal bunnies. They are seasonal bunnies. So we have the (laughs) Halloween hair, the Christmas cottontail. Of course, there's the book about that. And then now there's the Thanksgiving thumper. I see a series of children's books coming up. So you want to hear what I did? I do want to hear what you did, Dee. Desperately, I want to hear it. (laughs) My son-in-law and my son and my husband came. They all were here on Saturday In fact, my son-in-law came all last week, and we worked really hard to get the limbs up out of the garden. So that giant limb that I've been showing online in various places that was on top of my glass, it's gone now. But there's tons of leaves and tons of debris. It's going to take forever to get it all up. But the good news is I had time after we got all the hangers out of the trees, I was able to go out in that new bed and plant a bunch of bulbs. And I planted a daffodil too. And it was a daffodil I've never grown before. Tell me about it. It's called Silver Chimes and it's a tazetta. And um, normally Narcissus tazetta are the things we force inside and call paper whites. But there are also ones that you can grow outside. And Silver Chimes is hardy to zone six. And so I planted that and I planted some tulips and the Jacqueline Vanderkloot method, where you throw them out there like you did this year, too. I did that at my sister's, yes. Mix them all up, right? And so I did that, yep. and I also bought a really cute little mum for the inside of my house. And then I'm going to split it. I like it so much that I'm going to split it and plant it outside when it's done. And it, we, you and I looked it up because we thought it was cute. It's called Viking right. Yellow. I bought it at the grocery store, believe it or not. Most mums are hardy in Oklahoma. So this little tiny mom, I'm going to plant in the front of that border. I think that'll be fun for fall. Well, when you talked about that mom, I, when I was at the grocery store, I looked for a pretty mom and I just didn't see any. And I will tell you that if you're in Indiana, we are outside the window of opportunity to plant a mom and have it survive the winter. Yeah. They, they really need to be planted back in September or earlier. Because otherwise, they're, they're going to heave out of the soil and dry out. It's just not going to be pretty. So, But buy them to enjoy. Nothing like a good mom on a Thanksgiving table. Yeah, I think it'll look great on the Thanksgiving table. So we have a quote, which is, uh, it's actually a poem. 
It is. That We're going to do little bits of the poem all the way through. So you start it out. The title of the poem is The Mist and All. I like the fall, the mist and all. I like the night owl's lonely call. That's the first stanza. It's very lovely. And I will say that we had rain Saturday night and Sunday. Maybe we, some on Saturday. We had so rain we too. Had mist. We had mist too. It's like our weather's so, the same right now. I guess. Weird. So the flower thing we're going to talk about, we talked about Garden Design published a trend report, and we were going to go through some of it. And they said trend number six was people would be choosing one color and going for it in the flower garden. So we're all familiar with the all-white garden at Sissinghurst in England that you've been to. Vita Sackville West is famous for the all-white garden. She is. And Dee, would you, would you plant an all-one-color garden? No. I would not do that. Um, even the white garden is not all white. It has some shades of pink in it, so it's not all white. But a lot of women, especially if you're dealing with uh, women in the, oh, I hate to even use this word, but upper classes, rich women. Rich women always want white gardens, and I think it's all because they've heard of that garden. And so they think, I'll get a white garden. I have a story about that. You do? And I, I think I saw this on Oprah like decades ago. But Barbara Streisand was on, and Oprah made a comment that the microphone she was using to sing perfectly matched the sweater she was wearing. And she said that was on purpose, that she she has the microphone painted to match her sweater. And then they were talking about, so Barbara Streisand, the roses planted outside the dining room window match her dining room decor. Okay, well, Barbara Streisand is notoriously particular about things. (laughs) One could almost call her OCD. I almost get the microphone because that would make the microphone perhaps disappear, you know, so that she just looks like she's singing. But um, I, I have heard of people extending their garden colors out into the garden from their house because they want it to be one seamless look. I am just not that picky. I am not that picky either. Now, I have thought about planting a flower garden with all green flowers, naturally. That's because you love the color green, but that would be boring as all get out. Yes, and I was trying to think of, you know, there's Bells of Ireland, which is Molasella Lavis. Yeah. There's greenish gladiolas. There's greenish zinnias like Envy. And then tulips, dahlias, mums. But you're right, it would be boring. And I liked it so much, the idea. I actually have a book around here called Green Flowers by Allison Hoblin. Yeah. And it's lovely. And if I wanted to do it, at least I have the reference book for it. So I think green flowers are really great as an accent piece, especially in bouquets. So in a cut flower garden, I love MV zinnias. I do. Oh, and, they're beautiful. And I planted a green and pink t- uh, tulip bulb in with those silver chime daffodils. We'll see if it gets eaten by something. But if it comes up, it's going to look really good because green and pink look really good together, as does purple and green. So green's a great accent color. That's why Bells of Ireland is used in bouquets, especially bouquets with little Irish reticulata. So pretty, right? Or actually, they're, actually, they're probably Dutch iris because iris reticulata wouldn't have long enough stems. But Dutch iris no. have those long stems. And you can see purple Dutch iris with, you know, Bells of Ireland. That would look great, right? Yeah. I don't think of it so much as an accent as much as a filler. Okay. Maybe a filler. But. I guess it's not a focal point. If you had a whole green garden, it would just fade, wouldn't it, into the background? It would fade. Yeah. Now you wrote in your latest newsletter, you wrote about blue flowers. I did. It was called Color Me Blue and people can sign. We're going to link to my newsletter on, um, on here. And you can also sign up for my newsletter at both my websites, but I do it once a month, just like you have a newsletter that you do once a month. That's correct. So if people don't hear from us enough weekly, then go sign up for our newsletters. That's right. So blue flowers are, as you pointed out, they're notoriously hard to find true blue flowers for the garden. Extremely hard to find. In fact, blue in nature is the rarest color. 
just period. So it's really hard to find blue flowers. But there are a bunch of blue flowers out there, some of which can be grown in our temperate climates, some of which cannot, like Himalayan blue poppies. I have people ask me about once or twice a year, can I grow Himalayan blue poppies? No. You can grow them in Himalaya, Himalayans. So if and if you Himalayans. want an exercise in frustration, why don't you plant an all blue flower garden, huh? Yeah, I think that would be really hard and you'd have a lot of purple in it because some blues are close to the purple. But like blue cornflowers, bachelor buttons, those are a true blue. They're blue. They're very blue. Yeah. Larkspur, very blue. Unless the lead wart that I have out front that I always have to look up the name, false plumbago, I think some people call it. It's a sort of a ground cover. It has a true blue flower. Very lovely. Right. Both cape plumbago and false plumbago, both are blue. And I grow a lot of cape plumbago in my garden in the summer because it's a hot weather plant. So you can do that, but I still like a varied garden. I do too. And you know what? I don't even, I don't even care if two colors clash next to each other. It doesn't really bother me. Me neither. I'm just glad something grew. I'll be honest. Yeah. <laughs> so know? choosing one color and going for it is supposedly a trend. So we'll have to look up and see, you know, they have that um, color of the year. You know what I'm talking oh, about? Oh, yeah. The Pantone color of the year. Uh-huh. Yeah. Is What's the Pantone color of the year for 2021? Do you want to look that up real quick? I'll see if they've announced it yet. They usually announce it in December, don't they? Oh, I don't know. But that would be nice to know. Now... There's some people that wouldn't do all yellow flowers because they just don't like that yellow school bus yellow right. in the garden. Like our friend Lanny out in Rhode Island. She doesn't she, like school bus yeah. yellow at all. She'd rip it out. Um, it looks to me like they haven't chosen their color of the year yet. Let me look and see. They're, they're actually talking about color trend highlights. Oh, this is interesting. It's called Summer Bouquet. Um, the color trend highlights, they have several different color trend highlights. We'll link to that. But I don't think they've announced their new color of the year. So, D, how are we supposed to plan our gardens without knowing the color of the year yet? Yeah, how will we do that? I, because we'll <laughs> just do it the way we've always done it. <laughs> exactly. So we wish everybody the best if they're going to choose one color and go for it. We suggest you not choose blue. That's too hard. Uh, white's been done a thousand times. Watch out for screaming school bus yellow. Um, <laughs> green, we said, was going to be kind of boring. So I guess we're we're recommending that maybe that's a trend you don't really care about. <laughs> rebels. We're rebels. Yeah, I think, I, I think we'll, yeah, we're just total rebels around here. You want to do the next quote? I do. I do want to mention, by the way, and we should find a link. There is another book. So there's a book, Green Flowers. And there is a book, Blue Flowers, and I used to have it. I loaned it out and it has not come made its way back to me. So we're going to look for that and add a link to that as well. Because okay. we don't want we to discourage do somebody from beating their head against the wall and trying to have an all-blue garden. I mean, did I, did I say that right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> all right. So onward. I'll do the next part of the quote. And Perfect. wailing sound of wind around, I like the gray November day. I do too. <laughs> I, I love this poem. It's actually a children's poem, and I I can just see kids saying it to themselves, you know, as they're dancing true. around outside, jumping in the leaves or whatever. So this, the, our part about veggies is another garden design trend, and this would be number four, growing foods in all kinds of spaces. Yeah, people have been doing that for a while, but, I mean, you know. Well, if this, and we, we don't want to say the P word, continues, I think people are going to have to hunker down and grow vegetables again next year. And maybe with a year of experience under their belt, they'll have a better experience and they won't just abandon it. Well, here's what I hope for. I hope that in spite of the, the COVID, um, I hope we get vaccines really soon. It sounds like it's pretty promising. And I hope that it goes away, but I hope people continue to grow vegetables because they ate some of those vegetables and they loved them. I love the ones that I picked and ate. So I think that this is a spot on trend. I mean, really hard to predict. People are going to continue to grow food. And so we should tell people like, don't wait until you need the seeds to order them. 
I got my first seed catalog just uh, maybe a week or so ago. I did too. So it's tis the season, and I know somebody that's ordered some seeds because she had problems finding seeds last year, and she just wanted to make sure that she got the seeds she wanted. Yeah, and I ordered some seeds. It wasn't, I don't, yeah, I ordered some lettuce seeds too to put in my um, covered, you know, spaces, my cold frames. Um, but I also ordered some seeds for uh, larkspur because I wanted to put some in that new bed with the bulbs. We'll see if that worked. Yes. You know, you have to you have to put out the seed around now or October. So you you wanted to ask me if I'm going to eat anything from my garden for Thanksgiving. I actually grew some lettuce in that veg pod, uh-huh. and I started it late, and I started some radishes too. They did just okay, but the lettuce did great, and I'm probably going to eat that lettuce sometime this week. I don't know if it'll be for Thanksgiving though. Well, I sadly have nothing from the garden for Thanksgiving because it, around here. I really would have had to uh, freeze something like green beans, but we're not going to talk about our green bean fiasco yet again. You're shaking your head no. (laughs) So that's the only thing I could think of that I might have had to plant. But there's obviously I've covered up the garden. There's nothing left. So I'm going to have to eat all my Thanksgiving meal out of a can. Just Out of a can? I'm kidding. Are you not going to make your own? I was like, come on, you cook this. This year you started cooking a lot. So I don't believe you. I'm sure you'll make mashed potatoes. Mashed potatoes and green bean casserole. We've got to have those. Of course, turkey. What are you fixing? Noodles. Got to have noodles. We don't do noodles in Oklahoma for Thanksgiving. I know you guys do. Um, I'll have cornbread dressing. I'm making a turkey. In fact, I'm going to buy it today because I got a fresh turkey, and I figured they could keep it in their much cooler refrigerators than I could. So I'm going to go get my turkey. I'm going to make mashed potatoes. Uh, We do uh, sausage wild rice. That's a southern Texas thing. It's It's not really a southern thing. It's a southern Texas thing, and it's from Bill's family. So we're going to make that. And, of course, will you bake a pumpkin pie? No, I don't really like pumpkin pie. Okay. Will you have pie at all? No. I'll probably have a bowl of ice cream. So my kids voted for a pumpkin pie and a chocolate um, pudding pie. My mother used to make this chocolate pie, so they're going to make it. So they're, um, they're, they're making some of the food this year, and I'm grateful for that. That is very – we have a lot to be grateful for this year, despite everything that has gone on, I think. Oh, I think we do too, and I think it, we need to focus on it. I've been, I've been thinking about a lot of things for the next newsletter, and I write down little notes in my um, word processing program of things I think about, and then right. I pull it together. Because, because you and I are very different on how we approach pretty much everything, aren't we? You're much yeah. more orderly. Uh, I would. Well, perhaps, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to do the next quote. Are you ready? I am. And bear dead boughs that coldly sway against my pain. I like the rain. I like to sit and laugh at it. Oh, that is so cute. That is cute. And yesterday I got to sit because it was raining for part of the day. So I sat and did a bunch of reading. And I um, looked over the book, Hydrangeas, Beautiful Varieties for Home and Garden by Naomi Slade. And the photographs are by Georgiana Lane. And I got this book earlier this summer as a review copy. Right. I I did not. I got to tell you, Dee, this is a gorgeous book with pictures of all the different types of hydrangea flowers. Yeah. And there's been a real burst in what, and what's available out there. I mean, I'm not kidding. Well, no. And according to the author, the Royal Horticultural Society Plant Finder listed 1,876 cultivated varieties of hydrangeas at the time she wrote this book, and it was just came out in 2020. That That is a lot of hydrangeas, mm-hmm. and I have a confession to make. You don't have a single one, do you? No, I have several hydrangeas. Thank you very little. <laughs> I never can keep them all straight. Oh, you and can't so, keep them straight? What? Okay, I can't wait to hear this, because this, this surprises me, because you're usually... Um, more 
able to do that than I am about things. But I really do kind of have a hydrangeas down because I've written about them a lot. Uh, well, I've uh, after going through this book, I, I'm pretty good with the hydrangea arborescence is a native to the North America and yes. one of the first ones that was brought into cultivation in the 1700s. Right. It was, and that's cool. And then hydrangea quercifolia, the oak leaf hydrangea, and I have several of these. And I'll tell you, for fall foliage, that's what I was the oak leaf say. hydrangea, <laughs> it's stunning. It is stunning. It's one of the best. It holds its leaves longer than the paniculatas do. It holds its leaves as long as the arborescence. It turns a glorious russet red that I just... Yes, almost mahogany red. Oh my gosh, yeah. It starts out lighter, and as it ages, it just gets darker and darker. It's the color of my buffet that I'm looking at as we're recording. Is the, It is one of my yeah. favorite plants, and in fact, I'm thinking about putting in some new corsifolias because they're great. So that one's native. Now, the paniculatas... Are they native to the U.S.? The paniculatas are not native That's to the United States. Yeah. And the macrophyllas are not native to the United States. And then the um, serrata is also not native to the United States. So an easy way for people to remember these hydrangeas, macrophyllas are the mop heads. The serratas are the mountain ones. They're mountain hydrangeas. Yep. The paniculatas have pointed buds and pointed flowers. That's why they're called paniculatas. And the corsifolias are oak leaves, which is what oaks are too. They're corsus, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so obviously she did not cover all 1,876 cultivated, cultivated varieties, but she does kind of divide them out and she has chapters on elegant and airy. So if you want to like a elegant and airy flower, she's got the pale and interesting, cool and crazy, and then brilliant and bold. And then she has a nice chapter on how to grow these and take care of them. And everybody thinks that every hydrangea likes to be really wet. And actually, like, arborescence doesn't really require the same kind of moisture as, say, the serrata. Right, so I right. Have- Which is why I can grow corsifolias, arborescence, and paniculata the easiest. I do have tough stuff, which I think is a macro. Villa, but I'd have to go look that up. It might be a serrata. Anyway, I was also going to say lace caps. They're probably in her light and airy ones. Yes. They're macrophyllas yes. too. Um, By the way, Tough Stuff is a serrata okay. because I have it, and it has it has been three years of doing almost nothing. Mine just It is there. about to be evicted. Okay, me too. Um, I'm glad you said that because I thought it was me and that I just can't grow the dang thing. It's not true. I, I'm so glad to hear that. Thanks. It's about to be evicted because it's got a prime spot next to the garage where you can see it from the street. And it's like, it's, it's, I kind of gave it the stink eye this fall and was going to maybe dig them and just, they're like three and they, they're so small. They've done nothing. Might have just, just sat stick there. Stick them somewhere. <laughs> And just stick them somewhere back in the back and say, either you make it or you don't, but I I got no time for this. Yeah, I don't either, because as I told this lady, because somebody said I could wait for my Japanese maples that died down to one stick, that I could cut them all the way back and they might come back. And I said, I'm 58 years old, I don't have time for that. So what I'm thinking of putting there instead is finding some dwarf oak leaf hydrangeas and putting those where those serratas were. And I think it'll be glorious. That's what I'm going to do. And Thanks if you, for making that decision for oh, me. Oh, you're welcome. And if you want a smaller one, plant uh, ruby slippers. Because ruby slippers only yes. gets three feet by four feet versus, you know, some of the other yeah. ones. There are so many that different would be a good one to plant. hydrangea corsivolias out there. If you want a really big one, hydrangea alice. I have that one in my garden. And it's huge, but it and it lost a lot of limbs, but I'm just going to cut it back. And um, Corsifolia, they can also handle a lot of sun. Well, this location has a lot of sun, so I'll think about that. Okay. Well, that's. I think Corsifolia is a great choice. And I think Ruby Slippers is a great plant. I grow, I have two of them down in the full sun. So I just really love them. That's a neat book. Hydrangeas, Beautiful Varieties for Home and Garden by Naomi Slade. And we liked, I liked it. I know you didn't get it. I liked it. And uh, it's very lovely. It's from Gibbs Smith Publisher. Cool. All right. Let's move on to our next segment. We're going to f- wrap up the poem. Poem. 
poem. And tend my cozy fire a bit. I like the fall, the mist and all by Dixie Wilson. Yeah, Dixie Wilson was a, a children's writer. And this would be a really cute poem to put on something and have it up by your cozy fire. So on our dirt this time, last week, we were talking about how I wanted a blue tree in my garden. And I said, I might go and plant a blue spruce in this one corner that I can see from my bedroom window. And you said, uh, not the best choice. They are very problematic in Indiana these days. Not so fast. And so, uh, well, they're not easy to grow in Oklahoma no. either. On the Purdue uh, website, the extension, they say, Colorado blue spruce is not native to Indiana. No spruce is, and I assume the same as Oklahoma. No. It often suffers from no, environmental not. stresses such as drought, excessive heat, yeah. humidity, and compacted or heavy clay soils, making it an already poor choice for our landscape. And then it says, if that's not enough, it suffers from needle cast diseases. And so a lot of times you'll see them, like the whole tree will just up and die. And sometimes like all the lower branches die off. And so I'm going to say, I, if you're going to plant a blue spruce, and I've planted it before, um, don't expect it to live forever. They're beautiful. Yeah, they are beautiful blue. Um, so is Arizona cypress. And Arizona cypress is native to Arizona. So we know it can handle heat. And it likes sandy soil. And where I live, I have sandy soil with pockets of clay. And the spot I want to grow it has water. Because I've learned a long time ago that I'm not the kind of person who will keep up with the watering all summer of a new tree. I know myself. So I always plant my stuff where my water will get to it. And so if I plant something, it will probably be an Arizona cypress, which actually has a lacy, you know, look to it. So I already have one in another part of the garden, which it is slow growing. I'll say that much. It's a very slow growing tree, but I grow a lot of those. And then there's Deodore cedars, which also do well here. So I have feeling blue, but it's feeling blue is horizontal. So I wanted a vertical tree. So maybe it'll be an Arizona cypress. Maybe I won't plant a blue spruce. Well, I just talked you out of blue spruce. You'd be nuts to plant a blue spruce, I think. Oh. I'm just going to tell you. Okay. You'd be nuts. Okay. Well, maybe. All right, so our next quote is, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. That was from Steve Jobs, and I thought it was a great quote um, because it is a lovely quote. None of us, I like it. None of us can be anybody but ourselves. And when you compare yourself to other people, which social media sometimes makes us do, um, you can get really kind of down in the dumps. And so I think being yourself is important. I think being yourself is important too. And as you know, I still have not gone back to social media, so I'm not comparing myself to anybody. <laughs> I am back on social media, but not uh, to the extent I used to be. And I think I have to stay that way because I just, I, I don't know, I get sad when I spend too much time on it. So let's talk about our garden commissions. And they do not have to be the same because we are each a unique individual. Right. So what are you going to do? So I'm going to hunker down for Thanksgiving. I do have to go to the store. Uh, I'm going to look after my house plants, and I've got to tweak the outdoor lights because, like I said, I put them up. They seem to work, and then a bunch of them didn't work. So I got to go back and fix them. Yeah. And then I plan to read some good books. Maybe work on my own next book, which I'm working on to publish in the spring. That is my week. That's my commission. Boy, that's a lot to do in one week, but. Good job. Nothing heavy. Nothing heavy. Nothing heavy. Okay, so I'm already reading good books, and um, I got The Autumn Garden by Alan Lacey, or Garden in Autumn, and that was one we discussed on a previous podcast, and I've read some of it, enjoyed it a lot. Um, also reading just some light novels, and I, I'm going to, this is going to be my garden commission for everybody. Keep it light. If you want to plant some paper white bulbs or an amaryllis, Go plant one and enjoy it over the holidays. You can find amaryllis everywhere right now. Um, they're in every yep. store from Target to the grocery store, little kits. Go on and buy those kits because even if they're just Red Lion, which is the most common amaryllis, it'll bring a lot of joy to you in the Christmas season. Also, be careful out there. Vaccines are coming. 
And so let's all be careful in the meantime. Right. So that's my garden so commission. So that's your commission? Yeah, I'm going to plant. I've actually got a few paper whites to plant that I'm going to do. And I think I got everything else planted. And I also bought some Wakefield pottery. But we can talk about that next week. We can. So we want to thank everyone for listening to The Garden Angelist. If you like our podcast, please tell your friends about us and also hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. And if you listen on Apple Podcasts, we'd love a five-star review. That helps us get noticed by others. We really appreciate it. Yes, and be sure and check out our show notes for links for more information about today's topics, plus links to our own websites. And if you want to help support us, use those affiliate links. If you buy something after clicking through on them, we earn a small commission and it costs you nothing. And Dee, yes. we want to thank our listener, Becky, who walks with us, or we walk with her every week while she listens to the podcast. So shout out to Becky. Yeah, thank you, Becky. It was a great email. It was lovely to chat with all of you over the garden gate today. Bye until next week. Bye.